So uh, welcome to this uh, session about how to inspire hacking. Um, we're going to talk about okay. creativity today. <laughs> that was fun? That's yes. okay. That was fun. I'm drum, we don't do fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's just start with a quick uh, introduction from you guys. What's your name? Where do you work? And just a quick word about Wait. what? <laughs> Sorry? <Okay. laughs> So I'm David Eriksson, Teenage Engineering, uh, Head of Hardware, uh, making, for those who weren't here in the morning, we're making synths, speakers, electronics, stuff like that. Say a word about the, what you take away from this day. Just one word. Can we wait? No. <laughs> Let's do it backwards. Can listen to it. Uh, um, ooh, one word. Fun. Fun? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, Chris Harmon, Microsoft. Um, I worked on a lot of open source stuff and a lot of open hardware, playful things as well, especially getting kids into computing. And a big fan of Teenage Engineering because I saw them at Resonate Conference giving a great talk there. Um, and one word to take away, whatever is not nailed down. Um, I think there's some uh, insight, hmm. hopefully. Thanks. Sonia? Um, I've just uh, spoken. Right. Sonia Petrovic yeah, yeah, yeah. Lundberg, Artificial Solutions Research Engineer into Natural Language Understanding. And my word would be potential, both for trouble mm -hmm. and for good things. That's good. Hey. Hey. Uh, I'm Frederick Hegemar. I run a company called Another Tomorrow. Uh, we help companies and organizations to uh, discover, prototype, and test ideas fast through interdisciplinary collaboration. A lot of words. Mm. Uh, my takeaway of today is lack of women. Yeah. Where are the women? I have two here now, but we need more <laughs> of you. Uh, so, no, but it's, it's fun, uh, encouraging, and, uh, and uh, also a um, lot of opportunities. My name is Sarah, and I work at Spotify, and I'm president of Swedish Geek Girl Meetup. And I haven't seen that much yet, but what I've seen has mostly been very creative and innovative, which has been fun. Okay, thank you. Um, so, personally, I uh, learned pretty late in life that anyone could be a creative person. Um, so, I was like, well, Creative persons are born creative. Like, wow, here's a creative genius. I can never be a creative person. <laughs> um, and then I learned that it has a lot, of that, lot to do with uh, leadership and people you meet and interact with. So I think there's a lot of people here who are in like, leadership positions. So I want to make this session um, useful for you guys. Um, I also learned pretty <laughs> late in life that if you want to be a creative person, you cannot be afraid of making mistakes. And uh, that's still very hard for me to understand, <laughs> so maybe this session will be therapeutic for me. Um, so I just want to start out with, uh, <clears throat> with this first question. If you can share a memory when you cracked an idea or solution, just because there was a leader there or a facilitator to, that created that space for you to go wild. You, you can think for a while. I, I <laughs> I, uh, maybe you can start with this. Right. Um, well, we talked about this before. Yeah. And you were the reason that made me go wild 2014. Me? Yes. Oh. Um, because we worked together. Uh, this is on not rehearsed. <laughs> no. <it's> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. She's not going to agree with me. Uh, but we worked together on uh, Feminist Initiative's uh, election campaign. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that made us stand out was that we live streamed everything on our own because we were never invited to any of the debates. Uh, so what we did then was to live stream at, uh, when Gudrun and uh, some other people were talking about the debate, watching the debate while it was happening and then sharing this um, across the web. And we did it in a very small scale. It was just us, two cameras, uh, one computer, encoders, and that's it. And then we just started pushing it everywhere. 
And then that created a concept that later on led to a bigger television concept that we developed for, uh, for our conferences and stuff. Mm. So w in that situation, m my leadership and some... Yeah, because your leadership okay. was basically, yeah, run with it. Ah, Do whatever good. you want. Which made me, you know, <laughs> kind of be like, okay, well, we can... Uh, since no one has invited us, we got to create that room for us, for us own. Then we started live streaming and you said, yeah, that's great. Keep doing that. So I kept doing it. Okay. So there was no holding me back like, no, you got to do it in these circumstances or you got to do it this way or mm. we only had 10 people watching, so we got to stop doing it. Mm. You saw potential in that, you know, at least we were creating something new, so we should try it a few times and it worked. Mm. It was a fun time. <laughs> Uh, Fredrik, do you want to...? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> it's a really good question, I think, because a lot of people say, you know, we have to think outside the box, and mm. most people doesn't even have the box to mm. think outside, so... Uh, and I'm usually the facilitator, that's, my, that's what I do for a living. Uh, but I remember once when I worked in communication, and, uh, and usually we did a lot of prototyping, then we tried to back, work backwards to find a, <laughs> a home for it, you know, and you know, we start, always started with a fun thing and then worked mm. backwards. Mm. But I remember the first time I worked with a planner, and she gave us the whole reason for, <laughs> for the idea. And that was kind of amazing to me, at least, mm. because we always walked back backwards, basically. Mm. What's, yeah. a, what's a planner's role? Like Is it to do research, find trends, you know, find a cause for what you're doing, uh, do you know, marketing analysis and stuff like that, so you know, okay, uh, we can, based on that data, create ideas. Mm. So they, are, they can become innovations, maybe, oh, okay. if we're lucky. So someone um, very specific gave you a, a sort of a goal, and then from here to there was yeah, they, kind of she gave us the space. box to think outside, oh, okay. basically. Mm. So I mean, it, I used to talk about music all the time. You know, it's, you have to learn the song to be able to improvise and have fun. Mm. So she gave us that's you know the <coughs> short. Oh, cool. Yeah. Thanks, Sonia. Do you want to continue? Uh, I think I kind of am starting to see a red thread <laughs> through our answers, and uh, actually my uh, first idea fits in. So it was, I was 19, early internet days. Uh, I was active in the Esperanto movement mm -hmm. and there was a foundation in, the, in North America uh, that wanted to support teaching of Esperanto. And I, I wasn't a language person at this time. I was a mathematician developer and I and a group four other youngsters uh, with similar background kind of came, approached this uh, uh, foundation and said, well, we want to build a web platform uh, for teaching languages. And the only uh, online tools for, t uh, for learning languages that existed at that time were done by language teachers. So they were li like digitalized uh, grammar books. Hmm. And we didn't know much about language teaching uh, but we knew much about web, and this foundation gave us money. So it gave us money and it gave us a, a task, uh, create something uh, that will help people learn a language, and free hands. Mm. And what happened was revolutionary. I mean, even today there is a prize that's given at North American Computer System Language Learning Conferences that carries the name of this project because it was people who came from a completely different angle, looked at the same problem, mm -hmm. and then we created something that we felt we needed. If we wanted to learn language, then we wanted to learn it in a way in, we, in which we use the internet. Sounds like there was a, a lot of trust here. Yeah, it, there was trust, and mm. there was, uh, I'd also say, courage. Mm. Uh, courage to make mistakes mm. and to try different ways. Um, yeah, thank you. I got most inspired by people that were around me with disabilities because um, they asked, they, they, first of all, I was impressed how they use computers without and being faster in programming than I am typing. 
some of them, that was really cool. And others just came up with problems that for me to solve. I actually, uh, I ran a conference called uh, around that as well, where I had a whole day of people with different disabilities showing where they get stuck on the internet. Mm -hmm. And then I had a second day with like people coming around and building prototypes how to fix that in mm -hmm. Facebook, in YouTube, in Google, and these kind of things. And that way, uh, uh, from the outcome from that conference, I managed to get a lot of people into the space that like understanding that there, when there is a need that it's much easier to be creative around that need rather than like mm. being creative and hoping somebody likes it. Mm. So finding uh, human needs to build interfaces that uh, or to to merge interfaces around was a very important thing uh, uh, for me to actually get into this whole role that I am right now. And before that, I used to be in the demo scene and I just try to make computers whatever they can do but I never had like a, a human uh, need for it so mm. I was like I was this geeky kid that wanted to make the machine do stuff and then I realized actually how about we make machines do stuff for humans and then it becomes much more interesting and I only learned that by finding the needs from other people so a lot of times we don't think we have something to be creative about but just look around and ask people where they get stuck and help them with their problems there's a lot of creativity in that one mm. cool thanks so uh, I guess it's a little bit the same for us, uh, but coming from a music perspective, uh, we really try not to do so, uh, like something that already exists when it comes to like the way you traditionally make music, mm. because mo most like let's let's take a drum machine for example, it's kind of hard not to do techno on a drum machine. You really have to like either be a really professional musician or uh, really try use it in other ways you just hammer the keys and record it into like some external gear otherwise it's just going to come out at, as like a four to the four floor beat so sometimes when we do stuff we instead like see it from a musical perspective how can we kind of make something that tricks people <laughs> to use it in another creative way mm. uh, i think a little bit yeah we have an old synth called op1 which is a little bit like that we got quite a lot of criticism in the, in the beginning. And then just a couple of months in, people said, I'm, I'm suddenly creative again because you know, I was just tied up with my computer doing everything and you know, painting uh, you know, kick drums in a grid looking like Excel. But so I mean, <laughs> hopefully we, we make someone happy doing something a little bit different. Uh, I'm thinking about your, your company name, um, Teenage Engineering. Because yes. I, I, I interpret that to be like, we play around here. <laughs> We're like teenagers. Is yeah, that, uh, fortunately, no one is a no? teenager anymore. <laughs> <No>. But, <laughs> but I mean, the, the name was actually something we came up with ages ago. I think it was '99. We mm. started talking about making hardware, mm. but it was way too early. I mean, you couldn't really. I mean, it's not like the the whole. I think back then you couldn't really buy the chipsets that you need to build what we are building now. Mm. That kind of came together with post cell phone era when the whole everything from raspberries and arduinos came and you could you still had to buy thousands of something to to buy it but mm. so we had to just wait from 99 to 2006 or 8 until we could really start building what we wanted what i really like about them is how they broke that barrier of like very expensive hardware to something really affordable and that actually showed itself in the packaging i mean when people do like Apple unboxing videos on YouTube mm. and you're like, this is so cultish, it's weird. <laughs> and uh, then you saw their stuff, you just rip it open, rip it apart, and this is your synthesizer. The packaging is actually part of the throwaway thing. Mm. So that, uh, I think, makes a lot of people less afraid of becoming creative because it's not this person, this perfect machine for professionals, it's just something to have fun with. And I think in most interfaces, we don't think about that enough. We make it shiny and amazing and very professional and we don't forget that people learn also by making mistakes. And games do that really well. In games, you have to play the first level to understand the mechanics of a game. But in most other software, we never dare to do that. We just give people instruction videos of 15 minutes and mm. everybody's snoring in front of the screen instead of letting people uh, uh, find out things by themselves. Because what we find out by ourselves, we retain better than something we get told. Thanks. Like bribable, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> got it. <laughs> so I guess you, you, got, you all been facilitators at a workshop or whatever, working with creatives or creative people. So what would you say is the most important ingredient to create a space where it's okay to fail hard? 
Like, how do you do that? Do you want to start? Or I, I can start. Okay. Uh, so it's all about having a process, of course. So everybody is aware of the step in the process. But what we do is a very simple thing that takes away a lot of the fear of failure is that when we do brainstorming, we always start individually. Okay. That's the key. Like how, how do they work? Like so individually we call it 10 in 10, everybody in a room. So let's say that we're going to do a workshop here. Mm. I'll tell you, you know, take a post-it and you, you do 10 ideas in 10 minutes. And then I put them in groups and then they share the ideas. Mm. So it takes away the uh, alpha hen. Right. <laughs> um, and, and it's been the key. I mean, we've been doing hundreds of them, and uh, it's, it always works. It takes away that. So it's okay to fail. And, and then also the m moment when you present your ideas to someone else is also yeah. like part of testing and stuff yeah. like that. So and also how it's received, right? Yeah. Like, do you have a process for that also? Like, how do you engage with an idea? To you know, develop absolutely, better. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Everything you know, it's it's very minute by minute facilitated. Okay. Uh, so I'm not going to go through the whole process, yeah. but it's uh, yeah. You have to be very strict as a facilitator. And also, what we do is like we don't put our creativity in the session. We only focus on facilitating. Mm. And uh, if we have blockers, I mean, mm. they, it yeah. happens that people know a little bit too much about their things. Um, I always add, you know. So what are you missing? Uh, yeah, I'm missing this global identification protocol. Okay, it's your lucky day, you have it. And you know, you have to add imagination and, and future to it as well. So when I worked at Google, for example, everybody talks about 10x. It's about you know, adding perspective. What is this product, your idea in 10 years from now? Or how can you make it you know, 10 times larger or 10 times smaller or whatever? Mm. And that really push you, and if you if you start thinking that way, 70% of the things that you believe are 10 years away is actually doable now. Mm. Okay. My brain is, is about to explode. Yes. <laughs> Sarah, tell me about what you do at Spotify. Um, well, both at Spotify and all the other rooms I'm in, we try to celebrate our everyday failures with something very nice. So. I mean, you don't only have failures when you're doing a workshop or when you're trying to come up with something and you're gathered, you also fail on your own, right? Mm. So like in your everyday job, which can be horrible <laughs> and life ruining for a day. Uh, so what we do is we go for fika, mm. we buy cakes and we high five each other and we say, well, now you're really a part of the team. Um, and like you collect failures? Yeah, pretty much. Kind of like how you connect, collect Pokemons. You kind of mm. collect failures, no. but then you also learn from them. Mm. So you, it's super important within a team that works with everyday support or with people and technology, which is really a, a recipe for failure, um, that you acknowledge your failures and you celebrate them in a healthy way and say, well, this happened great, now you can learn from that. Now you can grow, now you can try to anticipate the next failure if you can. Because that's really the most important thing. You celebrate, but you also learn. So you have to share. You have you to always share. have to share. You have failure. to share a failure. But not Because then you can turn it into celebration. Oh, okay. You earn, you, you earn a cake. Yes. <laughs> but also I think it's important to, even if, if the idea might be a failure at time, mm -hmm. it should be kept because suddenly you can reuse mm. it. Uh, for example, we, we got an assignment at Cradle Lab where I worked you know, to do uh, Google for Kids. Mm. And suddenly we had like hundreds of ideas that were failures that we could reuse mm. uh, you know, just by putting a different perspective on it. Good, cool. Uh, and I also think you need to uh, well, uh, be a uh, role model even for failures. Mm. I mean, if you as a leader are, are out there, not only informing others about your successes, but say, look how wrong I was, mm. and look how well it turned out in spite of it, or even if it didn't turn well, well, we are still here, and uh, it's behind us, and I've learned this and this from my failure, uh, then you are setting the tone. Mm. If you are claiming and embracing your own mistakes, then there is, uh, you're creating the culture where mistakes are also welcome. That's one thing, and the other thing, uh, uh, which I think uh, you were also into, of someone knowing too much. So sometimes there is this uh, 
uh, believe that there is a single correct answer and that you need to be an expert in order to provide this answer. Mm. I think the most, just as in my language uh, teaching platform uh, example, sometimes it is exactly when people who know nothing about some field start working in that field, when the, most, when the creativity really happens, because they don't know what's impossible. Uh, so because they're not experts, they don't know what's impossible, they aim for the impossible and they, uh, they succeed. So I think it's really good not to uh, give the experts more power or, or to start with the, not, not to start with the assumption that there is a single correct answer. There are many uh, answers and the most unexpected people or angle, angles can contribute to the, uh, the one that is right in the moment. I recommend to Google Lee Fleming Harvard Business Institute. I think it's my this. Uh, mm. She's hiding her phone. That's why she's my phone. Let's go. You come and No, but Lee Fleming, Business Harvard Review. Uh, he talks about this: the how aligned you are as a, as a team. The less aligned you are, the more you're going to fail, but the more you're going to have breakthrough ideas as well. So it's about all about failing fast. So Google yeah. that. He has this. Uh, uh, curve you can have a look at. Mm. Yeah. Failing fast. One of the most best things I've seen about that lately was um, uh, I work with several large corporations like Yahoo and like Government UK and these kind of things and you always get these enforced uh, uh, diversity trainings which are most of the time like don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. One of the most impressive things I've seen in, in my new company right now is that our diversity training shows a product that has failed and how by diversifying the team became a success. So uh, by showing that, like, by having a group of different people with different backgrounds mm -hmm. give their input into a failed product, they, they turn it into something better. And I think this is a wonderful, inspirational story to teach people about diversity, to understand, like, by listening to other people and other people's ideas, mm -hmm. you build something for everybody, because the outside world is diverse as well. Cool. So reorganize, like, work groups, sort of. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, it, it basically shows that, that something that diversity is not something you have to shoehorn into, but something you have to have to be creative. Right. It's something that is natural to have and not something that is like, oh, a weird thing that we somehow need to reach. Mm. That was the great thing about that. And showing how it made a failure of a product into a success is a really, really good thing as well. Going for successes is, uh, is very helpful as well. When you talked about communication is important. What I introduced at Yahoo was that every engineer has to give presentations to each other as well. We're not like the people in the corner that just mm. write code and mm. get a cookie from time to time. And I introduced it as, uh, as lightning talks every Thursday, 11.45 to 12, five minute presentation about something that got fixed in a project, mm. five minutes how it was fixed and five minute discussion if it should be a best practice that we're using on all projects. And that was great for people to get them into public speaking. And now I do public speaking coaching because they come from a success factor. They were already happy that they fixed something. So it's much easier to present about this. And as it's 15 minutes and they know everybody will have to do it, there's just no way to, to pretend that uh, I, I can stay in the corner and I'm not good enough because everybody makes mistakes and, make, and gives presentation. A bit like crayfish parties here where everybody has to be as embarrassing as possible and then nobody <laughs> cares anymore because it is just a very normal way of doing things. <laughs> That's not true. But David, you were talking about um, like you can only fail once because the cat's coat is oh, very yeah, expensive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, we, we're trying to, I'd say, we, we talk about it all the time, but we hmm. will never do it this way. But since the turnaround time can be something like six weeks from when you think you're done, you send off some fabrication drawing, mm. whether that's a mechanical part or a PCB uh, circuit board, that is. Uh, and then six weeks later, it, it comes back and it, it doesn't work at all. Mm. So, uh, and then of course, people get, for every time that happens, you get more and more worried that the next time, you know, because it, there's money and time lost. Right. So we try to release a little bit more often. I guess it's popular in the web world to release, you know, every five minutes you mm. can deploy something to your mm. servers. but. For us, it's more about trying to do that monthly mm. instead of like every third month uh, mm. because there will be something that you want to fix mm. anyway. So just lower the bar a little bit for, 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 for you know, the mm. people working with the stuff. 
How, how do you handle that? Like, when it happens? I mean, it's kind of the same with anything you do. You can polish forever, of course, mm. but if you're doing, let's say, software, you can always upgrade it tomorrow and, and again and again. Mm. And uh, it's kind of nice to know, especially for the products where you can't upgrade the software, that you know whatever I send off now will be exactly like this you know, a year from now or two years from now, which is probably the total opposite about you know, to, to, to anything else discussed here today. But that, that's kind of a nice feeling as well. It's kind of like making a, a record. You know, you can't really <laughs> call Spotify and like, hey, I want to just tweak you know, the snare drum <laughs> on that track. It's like, mm. it's, it's too late. And that's, yeah. that's kind of creative in, in a way. Uh, <laughs> well, I think the key thing is also trying. Hmm. That you have to, that your leader has to give you the chance to try and that the leader is asking questions more than giving answers. Hmm. That you're the one that's supposed to give the answers after you've tried ABC hmm. and that you keep it agile. So you're not waiting for the end to try to give your result and try to analyze and try to um, see how it went, that you keep it like, so we're going to go to from A to B and then uh, test it, see, okay, that failed, great. <laughs> so we know that, and then you move over to maybe D. So you keep it agile like that and keep making your leader ask the questions. Mm. So okay. you can try to find the answers and try to find a safe environment for that. I, I also think it's a balance of, um, uh, of ownership and control mm. because uh, there is quite a big difference of uh, giving uh, your team a task or a problem to solve uh, and then, uh, well, kind of uh, waiting to see what happens and uh, what mistakes happen and uh, giving a task to perform that can't be failed. It's clear instructions, but it also is very limited. So uh, I, I think giving a problem to solve both encourages mistakes but it encourages uh, creativity and mot in increases motivation. Uh, so uh, my experience is that it definitely pays in the long run. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. Playtime is important as well. I was one in the group but that introduced the hack days in Yahoo, the internal ones, which was like once a month. We had like a day and no engineering managers, nobody was involved, basically like do whatever they want and at the end of it display it and show it what it's like. And that was really cool for people to try out new technologies that they always wanted to try out on their business time because not all of us are like 19 year old engineers anymore that want to work at home. Other people have families so getting 24 hours from your company to be creative the, any way you want was very, very interesting. Uh, it, it backfired a bit when it became too much of an, uh, of an internal thing, when people just out of a sudden started to impress their boss with a hack day rather than <laughs> just being creative with it. Mm -hmm. So you had to sometimes stop people from doing that and also product managers trying to, trying to subvert it by saying like, oh, this thing had to get finished, so can you finish during the hack day and call it as a hack? Mm. So it needed oh. good leadership of those hack days because mm. these hackathons are now dime a dozen. They're like oodles and oodles of them on, uh, every week. And uh, um, a lot of them are just veiled ways of hiring people or like giving out some, some products to try for engineers to try out. But an internal hack, hack day is a wonderful idea. And sometimes it's hack weeks where you get like two hours each day at the end of the day to do whatever. And the most important thing about those is, is not to target them, not to say like you got to do this and that in a hack day, but just like be as creative as you want to. And it's amazing how much... Uh, people shine at that and then you find people that later on can become product managers and stuff because they, they didn't even know they had it in them because they were allowed to play. That's a very important part there. You, you talked about earlier today about the internet doesn't really want stupid stuff anymore. <laughs> like you, for those hack days, how important would it be to not just to hack whatever you want or like it has to be a for an actual client or a 
a product? No, not at all. It does. It should not be for a client. It can be for your home. It can be for your children. It can be something cool that mm. you wanted to do in your free time as well. But it should not be something that is in the normal delivery of the product right. uh, product company because it, it would disrupt the delivery cycle of the original product for starters. Mm. And it's uh, it's not. It's for you. It's your time to do things. When I talked about we don't want silly things, I just like I, I don't want things that are silly and cost a lot of money and are a product. I, I, I love, for example, I don't know what her name right now is, the, 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 uh, the one lady who does these really unnecessary robots that do like really stupid things that like brushed her teeth and completely failed at it. And I, I love when people take technology and play that way with it. I, didn't, I don't like it when these things become then something that costs a lot of money and is insecure and doesn't have a password on it and people use it online. That was the danger that I saw with it. So hack day products becoming real products should never be the case. Mm. It should be an inspiration for another product and then uh, build a real product around it and don't reuse what you've done on the hack day because that's like quick and dirty and we have enough quick and dirty code on the website <laughs> enough. Okay. But I also think you were onto something. Uh, uh, some some minutes ago, when you said that meeting people with disabilities often inspired you, and I think here, so uh, I guess uh, the principle of scratch your own itch as a developer is uh, quite commonly known. Like if you have a problem in your everyday life or work or whatever then you are in a good solution to uh, to solve it. I mean, I I if you have the knowledge and so on. And that's definitely something you can do during your hacking, yeah. hack we time. But also, I'm thinking sometimes it is not your problem, but it is the empathy that I think sometimes is lost, in, lost in, in, uh, in technology, but it can be someone else you saw struggling. Or if you as a developer are not too far away from the users, you maybe have observed users talk with them over a coffee break or something like that and noticed, well, this thing is really bothering them and there is maybe not no uh, financial motivation to help it, but that's what I can do. That, that That's what can make me really creative. There is a real problem out there that someone has yeah. that I might be able to solve. Incredibly good internal tools came out of hack days like uh, uh, user-facing products, I think the danger is that it disrupts it, but for example, what we did in, in Yahoo was like room booking systems, timekeeping systems, all of this software that we bought years and years ago and everybody hated using, we replaced within 24 hours with something cool that we could use internally. The scratching your own itch is definitely a big part of that. And uh, the, st the mm -hmm. interesting bit is what we really need to crack when it comes to that is to find needs from outside the nerdy community that wants to take part in a hack day and the people who don't think that they're technically enough to mm. take part in a hack day. So having a thought hack day where people just throw out things that are broken in the company and then giving it to the engineers to play with, that was another way, that would be a way to solve around these issues. Mm. But we found that very tough and I only was, what I was there for four years and then I left. Uh, to, to find that because no, no, we did like things like, it, it is very American, it was really weird when they did this like uh, science fairs where all products in the company showed the issues that they had and what hacks you could do around it. And that became very commercial quickly again. Like if it doesn't have commercial success, we're not gonna use it. So, but internal systems like HR systems are those things that you have to use in the company, definitely a good, good idea to get creative around because nobody gets hurt if the thing doesn't work. Yeah. That's the benefit. I mean, Google uh, Wave was a great example. It was one of the coolest technologies I've seen. No end user understood what that thing was. <laughs> but then it got into Google Messenger and it got into, uh, into Word, uh, uh, Google uh, Docs, Docs, and all these things learned from that project as well. So that was one of those 20% projects that out of a sudden got really big and then we had a problem with it. Do you want to say something about that? No, but yeah. I, I think, I mean, listening to you guys as well, uh, I think, you know, we, we're talking about creative technology, mm. but um, we're in a, an era right now where, the, where tech is far beyond our imagination. So we're actually behind mm. because we can't come up with things anymore to do with all this tech. So that's why we need this interdisciplinary collaboration. And mm. designers are so important in this world to come up with the fiction of science, mm. not the science fiction. Mm. Uh, and that's where <laughs> things start to happen. And you can see that in history. Just you know, go back and, and see the guys that came up with Star Trek and what the kind of devices they used. Okay, you can't beam yourself, but that's just a matter of time, <laughs> I guess. But you know, the cell phones and everything. But it's, it's you know, you have to. Uh, open up your imagi imagination and, uh, 
And you can see also see that, uh, that a lot of the big companies now is lacking creative leadership. Hmm. They have, uh, you know, a lot of psychopaths running the company <laughs> and, and aiming for money because hmm. that's the easy part. But hmm. you have to come up with new ideas. And you see Apple going down now. I mean, what happened, hmm. right? Hmm. And uh, we, yeah, we miss Steve. There's new interaction models, very human interaction models, that I find interesting. I work with HoloLens a bit, and it, it just fascinates me, this thing. I mean, this is not because I work for the company. It's just I was flabbergasted to basically put this thing on and realize that the world around me is my interface. I can put my emails there. I can put something in the screen there that I can work with other people by moving my hand around. It's proper, uh, it's proper Iron Man stuff. <laughs> and I'm crap at interfaces, that's where creative people need to help us to find these next news, news cases that were there. Everybody's going crazy about VR as well. Oculus Rift shows a lot of stuff. Google's Daydream just got released. There's a lot of cool new stuff and interaction coming our way, especially when it comes to voice recognition, emotion recognition in text, emotion recognition in voice. There's so many interface elements that we need creative designers that can create something for something without an interface. So there's a very, very big gap right now. I mean, Google hires, uh, hires uh, poets to, to, teach, uh, to teach language recognition about metaphors and about how answering in sonnet form to make people uh, find better ways to communicate with people. So the, the human technology barrier has been totally breached, but we forgot to keep the humans up. I wouldn't say that people in leading positions are psychopaths, most of them not, <laughs> I met a few. But um, I think the, what annoys me most is that Star Trek has no need for money anymore. Star Trek has no need for religions anymore and for big hierarchies anymore. And we haven't even started cracking that. Mm. We haven't even gone there yet. We just look after how can we make as fast as, as possible as much money with technology. And that's a sad thing. It should be there for humans and not for making money with it. Maybe we should hook up with filmmakers. Um, people writing manuscripts and, and directors. And, and that's how Google works, actually. They, okay. I mean, every idea is presented in a two minutes video at Google. Mm, like where a story? They, like a story about where they talk human? about the challenge, the solution, how it can scale. Mm. And it's all added storytelling to it, to add the emotional parts to it. Mm. But, but, you know, and, and those videos go to Larry and Sergey and they make a decision on it. But the most important thing, they take it to the engineers and show them this is where your product is mm. heading. And they're like, Okay, <laughs> I can make this happen. I didn't know we were going that direction, but yes, of course. Hmm. So it's so important. Some of them are scary. I mean, Her was one of the best movies I've seen in the last few years. Not the nicest, but it was just so close to comfort. It's like people being more lonely by sharing more and more with a machine than with the people around them. It was not a science fiction movie where robots beat, beat each other or things were exploding. <laughs> it was just like, this is where human interaction can go if we don't do something about it. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> indeed, because, uh, I mean, as I said, natural language interaction and understanding can be used for good and for bad things. And, uh, uh, well, I, I like to say that technology should do what technology does best, which is routine, repetitive tasks and so on that can be coded and protocoled, and then humans can do what humans do best. And here I'm thinking, I mean, who wants to work in customer service and answer the same question thousands and thousands of times? This is a perfect use case for let's automate this. But then what we see instead, as, as uh, Freddy was in, and I mean, the customer service virtual agents are partly abandoned, but what's invested in are, uh, well, virtual assistants or robots that elderly with dementia can interact with because research has shown that they need, they thrive, they are doing better if they have uh, 10 minutes of human interaction per day, and then what they get is 10 minutes of uh, interaction with uh, machines. And this, I think, is probably not where we want to go. Well, especially that we need robots to look after our elderly because we don't have time for them. That's the real problem there. Like that, uh, that we basically, that, that we automate things around us because we're too busy doing our day-to-day -day job. I mean, uh, we're talking about diversity in our market a lot. We never talk about ageism. We never talk about people who have a, a family to look after or elderly parents to look after. They cannot be in the office for the after party and play, be play beer pong with people. 
we should have uh, more uh, social ways in our company to allow people, uh, and that's creativity as well, like thinking about how can we keep our people in our company happy, which is not something that keeps 19-year-old white guys happy, but everybody, finding problems of real people. And I said this in another talk at Erdev, right now is a good time as a white guy in an interview to demand these kind of things from companies. They want to hire us. They want to give us lots and lots of money, but what we should ask for is like maternity leave systems, paternity leave systems, what about elderly, what about health system? Ask for the social change that we need to do while you're in a position of power, but we don't do that enough right now. Hmm. I like that. Um, hey David, um, what would you say is the most common creative killer? Creative killer, oh. Uh, Maybe that's a personal <laughs> question, <laughs> so go ahead. Um, I think maybe I mean for us it's 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 to be completely honest it I would say everything within sales and marketing and <laughs> and you know trying to like make a study of what might be popular is 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 for me like a total like takes ah. away all the fun. I mean, like market analysis? Or like there's a lot stuff of stuff like on the market right now that is purely market driven. It's like, it's very popular with headphones. Let's make another headphone. What's the latest Bluetooth technology? Okay, let's use that. Mm. Instead of asking why mm. use a new Bluetooth technology, it doesn't add anything. Uh, and often that idea comes from the marketing department. In some companies, yeah. yeah. We really try and, and, and avoid that, uh, of course. But I think I think, from like the chip companies, they try and tell you to buy this latest wireless connectivity chip because mm. you can do a yeah. temperature sensor using it. Mm. And then you have the platform companies saying the same thing. But there's no one really implementing products using it. Or there is a lot of temperature sensor products implemented, but instead of someone just like making a, an actual product using this technology that might do something completely different. Mm. Mm. And, and because you, you're... I think it's a little bit the same in the web world. There's a lot of good open source projects and frameworks, people that really build the foundation of stuff, but there's very few projects that actually gets released on top of it. It's kind of maybe, I mean, no offense with, with Linux uh, as a desktop OS, but there's something like the polish factor of the absolute, you know, that makes it a, a product that everyone wants to use is not really there yet. Uh, I mean, that, that's... The, and, and because I, I think there is like creative engineers and there is, you know, different type of, 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 of people working with each layer of like from, from the computer hardware to the kernel, which is Linux, to the applications. But there is a very little mix, especially mm -hmm. nowadays in, in the bigger companies. I mean, that's probably why yeah. some of the companies mentioned were successful because there were smaller teams that, that just like you know, we're going to make a kick-ass computer, let's do it. But now, now it's, there's so much distraction. Mm. You can choose, you can just sit there for two years and choose which platform to build it on and which well, frameworks. And that's, too much that's money. Also, <laughs> yeah, and it kills creativity because you mm -hmm. end up just researching instead of just pick the first best one and, and, and go with it, yeah. make a product, and then mm. start over instead of navigating through all this. That's good. Sarah, what would you say? It's the most common creative killer. Reporting time. Tidsrapportering. <laughs> <laughs> it's a classic, but it really, really does kill some creativity. It was a, a killer in my last job. And mm. uh, now we don't have that, uh, my current job. And it, I mean, I see some points of you have to kind of do it, especially if you're filming. You kind of have to know like how many hours does filming this person take, especially yeah. if they're busy. But reporting that doesn't say much except that you've put in the time. Mm. But you could basically do whatever during those hours. So you should look more on the results. Yeah. Um, and then also leaders giving the answers instead of asking the questions. Uh, and then having the team ask the questions I think is super important that you as a team, whether what you're working on, you need to be the ones asking, uh, giving the answers. Let a question come to you and then research, do the work, mm -hmm. try, fail, learn, give an answer. So any type of controlling is it's a creative killer. 
No, not any type of control. I think it, there has to be some kind of structure, otherwise you're just running around like headless hens, mm. uh, searching for the best way to work. You need some structure, but when you as a creative person try to be creative, it has to be some kind, it has to be on your terms a little bit, mm. because everyone has a different way of being creative. Mm. Like some people like to use computers, other people like to use post-its, and you have to be allowed to create your own workflow. Mm. Um, and you also have to be allowed to let it take your own time. Like, so we have some people at my job that work nights and some people that work early mornings because, mm. you know, that works for them. And you can't let someone else control that for you. Otherwise, I mean, I would fail just as much as I did in high school mm. because I'd had to be there at certain times and then leave at certain times, you know? Uh, so what I did instead was actually stay later to work. Um, and for my creative process, I just really need sometimes to watch YouTube for two hours, and then I can get to work. <laughs> <laughs> I need to watch my cat videos to get inspired. That's your uh, fuel. Yeah. A word from you, Frederick? Um, a killer? Uh, Give me a killer. Uh, it's a tough one. Uh, I think uh, the lack of purpose with uh, mm. their end result to me, I mean, mm. it's not money and time, that's for sure. And I mean, lack of, of vision and, and, and the goal, mm. because that kills the passion. Okay. So we're wrapping up now. Just a last quick question for you all. So how do you, like, how do you unlock that creativity, like outside the office? Do you have any tips and tricks of how you do your creativity reload? Mm. Like, like I, fr I go to. Uh, to the woods, take a two-hour walk, and uh, and when I do that, my mind starts working in a different way. So I, when I get back to my computer, I like uh, I can write for hours <laughs> or, or do stuff. What, what do you guys do? Like, a, what do you do to reload? Physical things. It's very important that your your brain really clears itself out if you do physical things. You said you go to the wood, you go for mm. a walk. I cycle in London, which is exactly a great mixture of exercise and suicidal attempts, because <laughs> uh, it's a really you need to concentrate what you're doing. But uh, when I, when I when I realized I've done like 20 miles on my own on my own muscle power, and I get home and I'm like my brain is completely free. Mm. Swimming is another great thing because I love my my whole body going into the water and basically divert, uh, uh, diluting every idea that I have into <laughs> the water just by moving. It's very very important to be physically active and to do running. And you don't do need to track it with your phone. Please do not go that out route. <laughs> Just do it for yourself and realize that you are a human being and an animal and something that can do something even if you don't have any machine with you, if you don't have anything with you. It's a very important thing to clear your mind by being physically active from time to time. Probably not the best uh, representative. I, <laughs> I usually relax by reading data sheets up and down. Oh. But <laughs> to be completely honest, we, I think we, we try and hang out a lot with uh, musicians. Mm. Uh, again, still work, but going to a concert, going to a club, mm. if you like dancing or whatever that, that might be. I mean, to That's me, that, that just, just, you get so inspired, like making uh, stuff, uh, music hardware for making music or just purely, you know, uh, seeing other people being creative is, is, is to me like the, the whole thing with, with the whole music scene. Uh, I see you do chakra dancing or something. Uh, s sometimes, yes. <laughs> Good. Uh, and uh, like I showed earlier this morning, we also started a little band. Just instead of having these Happy Hacking Fridays, we, we try and, 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 and make music together, uh, but always without rehearsal on way too big stages because that's, I think, is a good way of mm. putting a little bit of pressure on yourself. And Anyone not doing physical activities or nature stuff? Exercising? Uh, I, I play guitar. The guitar? Yeah. Okay. With, on your own? No, oh, in a band, yeah. In the bath? No, in a band. In a band? <laughs> like I in haven't the tried bath. to play it in the <laughs> well, bath, though. I play I electric it's not guitar. Electrical. It would be dangerous. <laughs> Maybe acoustic would work. As an outsider, there's nothing more frustrating than coming to Sweden because everybody's somehow related to music and super creative in their free time and they all are 
whining about how people are not creative enough. <laughs> this is cracking me up about this country. Everybody I know is mu musically talented or active, and at the same time, like, we should do more. And you're like, come to England, people get drunk and fall over, that's what we do. <laughs> like, it, it's just fascinating how much creativity is in this country already, so please use the creativity and do some good stuff with it. You've got four hours of daylight in the winter, do something with the other hours. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying. Last words? Um, I try to play with others, so play board games mm. and just hang out because I do really well with in groups. Mm. And when I work, I also want to be in a group because mm. I feel just more inspired when I have other people shouting stuff at me. Yeah. Um, so I just try to play board games, really geeky board games that just kind of tap into that creative part of my brain um, and then try to uh, go outside a little bit, try to skate. Skate. Yeah, mm. longboarding. Ah. Oh, yeah. That mm. you know, fear of falling on your face like, and dying kind of gives oh. you that extra kick. Well, mm. if I died, then I wouldn't have made this. <laughs> right. <laughs> I need to do this. Sonia. Yeah, actually, it's a com combination of everything, mm. but music. I'm not Swedish. I don't. Man I don't do music, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, but yeah, whatever makes me turn my thoughts off. Mm. Uh, that's kind of a challenge for me. Thinking algorithms, whatever, all the time. And then uh, I've experienced that if I manage to turn that off and then come back and have a second look, then it gives much better results, much yeah. more creative results than it can be a physical exercise or hanging out with really interesting people getting absor absorbed in their thoughts instead of my own. <laughs> or yoga, meditation, um, Building something, no, building something is also uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, thoughts, but even uh, it worked really well for me in high school when I did target practice mm -hmm. uh, and then just focused on that and came That's out cool. refreshed. So. Yeah. I can also recommend just um, creating something on your own, like making a little project. I used to make these little paper uh, people that I just printed out for my favorite video games. And then we put them together and just create a little army of crazy stuff. Um, obviously, you wouldn't show that to anyone because they would really think you're crazy. But that just, you know, because then you got to actually do something with your hands. It doesn't take a lot of time. And then you kind of get creative with it. Thank you so much. A big applause. To Thank you.